This episode of The Minimalists is brought to you by nobody, because advertisements suck. The Minimalists. <laughs> Hello, simpletons. Welcome to The Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus, and together we are The Minimalists. I feel like we need a advertisement suck jingle. We do? Yeah. Or we could pay for it. Yeah, we could pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get like Canyon City to come up with a... <laughs> A jingle for us. Well, we're here with our returning champion. Peter Rollins is in the studio. Has anybody been more than three times? Am I only T.K. Coleman? I think yeah. T.K. Coleman is like a six-time guest. Well, yeah, six time? okay. Yeah. Oh, now I feel a bit. You are, uh, yeah, MVP runner-up. Okay, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but in my heart, you're MVP. Yes. Don't tell T.K. that. <laughs> <laughs> I love the fact, by the way, Simpletons is great because it's a it's a real dig, but then it's a compliment. Right. Like if you called me a simpleton, I'd be like, "What? What did you just call me?" And then you're like, "No, it's a compliment. You live a simple life. That's very clever. <laughs> it's a way to slag people off." Off without them knowing or it's, the other way around it's <laughs> reclamation we, we're, yeah. we're taking that you we're, we're all acknowledging that we're a little bit gullible we're a little bit foolish right ryan and i are the head simpletons and so you know our audience uh, we, we all recognize that we you know we, we don't take ourselves a little too seriously yeah. here mm-hmm. well uh, let me let me ask you all this do you feel like you don't have enough even when you have too much mm. today we're going to talk about the fear of missing out, FOMO, right? Also, there's this term, JOMO, the joy of missing out. Yeah, and and you know, it's it's fascinating. We don't think about it. I almost said the happiness of missing out, but then I wrote down the acronym. Like, what? Wait a minute. <laughs> Uh, so, so we're going to go with Jomo. In fact, uh, later on the Maximal episode, I've got an excerpt from our new book, Love People Use Things, and uh, we talk a bit about Jomo and how it applies to productivity. Mm-hmm. And we're going to talk about maybe it can apply to stuff and, and the other areas of our life as well. And the reason we wanted to have Peter here today is we want to discuss being content in the midst of uncertainty. Mm-hmm. There's this, uh, so we're calling this episode The Lacking. And, oh, nice. and, and, and here's why it, it, it really stood out. If you go to our Wikipedia page, there's a criticism and controversy section there. And um, I, I write a lot in that. <laughs> Every time someone deletes it, I have to go back in, put it back up. It's a real hassle. It's just me going in and deleting, and Peter going back in, reinserting. <laughs> so um, here's what New York to- or New York Magazine said about the minimalists. Though on the surface their message is more or less positive, there's a tacit pessimism to Milburn and Nicodemus's movement. <laughs> Rather than trying to change this mindset of austerity, whether through therapy, politics, or protests, they advocate making do with the lack. Oh, that's nice. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yeah, that's how is that, how, how yeah, is that criticism? Yeah. Right. I also love, by the way, that your critics are like, is that the New York Times? Yeah, like New York my, Magazine. New York, yeah, my, my critics are like, my mum. You know, it's like, <laughs> as, as my friend would say. So that's, like, that's great that they actually, <laughs> that's brilliant. But that's also, yeah, it's lovely. So, so, so this, this concept of the lack, making do with the lack, and to me that almost seems like, a a compliment right yeah. Yeah. so let's talk about the lack and why so many of us are very uncomfortable with mm. the lack yes we want to lack the lack i mm. mean that's the yeah. what, that's our desire is to lack the lack mm. yeah um first of all i i feel like i've got two responsibilities on this show and by the way it's so nice to be back i'm loving this it's good to have you back, yeah, man. yeah you know, i've been you. self-isolating in my apartment so this is lovely nice. um first job is to give a philosophical framework for this question, lack, fear of missing out, look at the big picture. Mm. And then connected with that is to make sure that I destroy your audience, that I make sure no one's watching this by the end, (laughs) that we do so much (laughs) philosophy that there's only one person left standing. All right, right? all right. My my job will be done when you're homeless, right? (laughs) (laughs) Because I would love to kind of take a, like take a bird's eye view of this question and then focus it in. Yeah. So the first thing about, it, I would love to basically talk about freedom for a second. What is freedom? Mm. Um, and you may know in philosophy, first year philosophy class, people will ask the question, are we free or are we determined, right? Mm. Is there any such thing as a free act or is everything you do because of something else mm. in the past, right? And, this um, is a sort of free will argument versus determinism, yeah. right? Yeah. So okay. you've heard that argument and you know, any thoughts on that, by the way? I mean, I don't believe we possess free will. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's the usual. <laughs> I feel like I have free will, but I don't believe I have huh. free will. <laughs> that's, that's actually my position. Okay. Well, I want to try and convince you otherwise. Okay. Brilliant. Oh, this right. is good. I was right. hoping awesome. you would say that because yeah, right here's right. here's the 
So on the surface, totally. So determinism means uh, an, a, an effect has a previous cause. So if something's determined, it's got some cause that affected it. Mm -hmm. Freedom would be something happens without a cause. Right, so yeah. determinism has causes. Freedom is something that happens novelty, spontaneously, without cause. And of course, the first, as soon as you hear this, you go, "Well, there's no such thing as a free act because everything has a cause, cause and effect." Yeah. But then you know you think about it a bit, and you go, "Well, except for the first cause, if er like so, for example, if, if the universe started with a big bang, mm -hmm. the first cause can't have a cause." because then it wouldn't be the first cause, right? right? Yeah. So you, you, so it would be whatever's behind that. So even if you have a chain of cause and effect, mm -hmm. you still have to go, well, what about the thing that gets it all going? Because that doesn't have a cause that it's an effect of. Anyway, you get into all these interesting things, yeah. but that's not the main interesting thing. Um, Immanuel Kant tried to answer this question, and he basically said this. He said that we're all determined, and animals are determined, and he calls this um, the hypothetical imperative, where we make decisions in, in light of our past, in light of what will maximize our pleasure, minimize our pain. We're all doing this. Your cat is doing this. A snail is doing this. Mm -hmm. Right, we're all doing it. That's great. But then Kant says, in the midst of this kind of like, we're just on reels being determined, something enters into our experience that he calls the categorical imperative. And he says, this is the feeling that there's something that you should do or shouldn't do, no matter what pleasure or pain is connected with it. Mm. Um, you see this in movies. I like Person of Interest, and we've seen it. But there's a, there's a cop in that who's, who's captured by the bodies, uh, human resources, who mm. are a shadowy organization in the police. And they're torturing him, and they're going to kill him, and they want to know where his friends are and he will not give them up. And he even threatened to kill his son. They're going to kill his son. And he mm. still doesn't give them up. Mm. That's kind of the experience of the categorical imperative. Like no matter what, he's just a line in the sand. Mm. Now, Immanuel Kant says this pretty much. He says that this categorical imperative is not something we know what to do with. It's not something we go, OK, I'm going to answer to it. It's a feeling that derails us. It's an experience that basically makes us feel uh, uh, we don't know what to do. So freedom, and this is, this is the argument, uh, freedom is not an act. You don't do free acts. You don't have freedom. You are freedom. Mm. You are freedom in the sense of you are the short circuiting of the universe mm. in which the hypothetical imperative and the categorical imperative smash together and you're utterly derailed, short circuited, and that experience is the not at oneness of the one. That is the not at oneness of the universe with itself. Mm. So there's no such thing as a free act, but you are the embodiment of freedom. Hmm. So at the same time, yeah. you're saying there's no, there's, no such thing, there's no such thing as a free act. Mm. There's also no such thing as a determined act then, yeah, it's in a way? In a way, it's almost like determinism is short-circuited. It's almost like um, a Mobius strip. It's like you're derailed. You experience um, an absolute shaking of your being. So for example, a cat never thinks, what is it like to be a cat, right? Mm. But a human thinks, what is it like to be a human? So we enter into this space where we feel like we experience what Kierkegaard calls the dizziness of freedom, where you feel like there's opportunities and choices and you don't know what you should do. Mm. That for someone like Kierkegaard is freedom. It's not what you do, it's the experience of of not knowing, it's almost like what stops you mm -hmm. oh, from moving. It's, yeah. it's what kind of decenters you. I like that. Yeah, like so. Uh, when I think about a cat, uh, for an example, they don't have free will because they're constantly just going after their impulse. Yeah. I need to chase this thing. I need to chase my tail. I need to eat. I need to. Yeah. Where we have the opportunity to stop and consider the act or whatever feeling we have. Yeah, and it's, it's, like, it's like something comes into our world that, that allows us to do that. Because mm -hmm. the question is, why are we like that? And yeah. for Kant, you can call it the law as well, but the categorical imperative is like something inside you where you feel, as I say, it's that feeling that there is something, for example, that you should do and have no self-interest at all. Like it's, it's no, you, you may never do it. We, maybe it's impossible to do it, but it's this sense in which there is, there is a call a law, a demand mm. that 
that it can't cause it non-pathological. What he means by that is not dictated by your pleasure and pain, not dictated by any of that. And it's just the feeling of it, just the feeling of it in your being mm. throws you for a loop. It mm. just, it kind of like just spins you into, and consciousness can be seen as the result. So th this is a way of saying almost, that's why I say you don't have freedom, you are freedom. Mm. It's like the short circuiting of biological reality causes the consciousness to arise mm. and consciousness is the uh, the experience of freedom. That's why I'm, uh, sorry, sorry, Sartre says we are condemned to freedom. He says like, you can't escape it. To be conscious is to be, f is to experience a type of not knowing, a type of uncertainty. Mm. Um, so freedom is a, it's a feeling. Is that, feeling. is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah. Oh, in fact, okay. yes. It's I like a very that. specific feeling. This is mm. so, so Kant says that, and then, and then Kierkegaard comes along and he says, the feeling is anxiety. Mm. The, so this, that's when you mean when you, when you talk about the dizziness of freedom, or, or in modern terms, we might say the paradox of choice, which mm. is a, a very, very similar feeling where freedom or choice, these are all, these are all good things, at least we, uh, ostensibly, they're yeah. good things. But then we walk into a Walmart and all of a sudden it's like, well, get me out of here immediately. I have too many choices. I have too much yes. freedom. And that causes anxiety. It causes anxiety. That's the, that's the absolute key. And you can feel this. You can force yourself to feel it. Like if you're driving down the road and you let yourself think, I could just turn the wheel and hit the side. Mm. And then you'll freak yourself out. Mm. If you think about it enough, you'll suddenly go, oh, oh I don't want, you know, yeah. because that, that's, that's what Kierkegaard calls that experience of, oh, or looking over a cliff mm. and then feeling I could jump. And then, and then you frighten yourself with that that thought. That's the dizziness of freedom. Mm. And the funny thing is, Kierkegaard says that that's what makes us human, and he calls it spirit. Spirit is the not at oneness of yourself with yourself. Spirit is the fact that you are derailed. You're kind of like you experience a sense of utter the abyss, really, the abyss of freedom, mm. and therefore. We shouldn't try and get rid of our anxiety. For Kierkegaard says, and if you try and get rid of your anxiety, you're trying to get rid of your freedom, mm. right? So what you have to do is find a way to accept and find beauty in your anxiety. So it's a very mm. different time. In, in a medical setting, they want to get rid of your anxiety. Mm. Right. But then it gets rid of your freedom. Like the people who take anti-anxiety drugs, you feel yourself becoming more, you know, a little bit more passive. Yeah. Uh, which is fine, because sometimes we need is too much anxiety, but mm. the cure, is to see that that is the evidence of your freedom. I think yeah. I think the terminus of this, you know, we often see people who commit suicide because they experience so much depression, anxiety, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and, and so you, you're absolutely right to, to, to extinguish the anxiety there. They were willing to give up their absolute freedom, which is you know, life in, in general. You, you're, you're giving up everything at that point. We have some anxious people who are calling in and we've got some questions for you today, Peter. Our first one is from Emma in British Columbia. So my husband, toddler, pet, and I live very comfortably in an 800-square-foot house, and we don't have a garage or a storage unit or anything in our parents' basements. I come by minimalism very naturally. It's sort of the way I've always done things, and my husband is on board as well. However, I also have a very high-change personality, and by this, I mean I like to shake things up a lot. Not in the super important areas, like I don't ditch my friends every few years and get new ones but I do tend to look for a new job after three or four years, even if I'm quite happy in my job. And at home, I love to redecorate, move furniture around, buy new rugs and pillows, etc. even if there's nothing wrong with what I own. So even though I always sell or donate or give away what I'm no longer using, like it's not like there's a cachet of old rugs or couches or something hiding somewhere in my house, it still feels really wasteful to me to buy new things even if they're secondhand, which they almost always are, just because I'm bored of a color scheme or a pattern. I get a lot of enjoyment out of redecorating, and I'm not spending money I don't have, but my husband often remarks, but you just bought that as something I've grown tired of is on its way out the door already. I would really like to improve to be able to hang on to items long term while still honoring the fact that I really like to change things up a lot. So any advice that you might have for a minimalist with a high turnover rate is appreciated. So Peter, we have Emma here and a few things stood out to me. She's a lot different from me. Yeah. So everyone has a, 
a need for certainty and a need for variety to some extent, right? Yeah. Now, she has a much greater need for variety. She's calling it a, a, a need for high change. You know, she, she likes to have things change all the time. A and I often say people don't hate change. They hate being changed. She likes to be the person who's doing the change. So, so in a way, I think both of these go back to a need for control. My control is like, I want things to be certain. I want things to be the same day after day after day. With her, she's like, my need for control means changing my situation repeatedly so that I have enough variety that I feel fulfilled. I, th I think both of us in, in that instance are are pursuing some symbolum of uh, a semblance of 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 control. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a good way of saying it. I look. I love the way you said how you said um, security and variety. Is that the way you yeah, describe yeah, those two yeah. things? Yeah, yeah. because in um, in psychoanalysis, there's this notion of desire and drive and desire is conscious and drive is unconscious mm. and desire is for things for a nice cup of coffee a nice meal with friends it's also for you want peace and you want kind of security in your life so desire kind of focuses around that mm. and we're conscious of that drive um, and this is a bit more bizarre but it'll kind of I think we'll unpack it more today but is about lack it's, it's where we get enjoyment from not getting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and we as human beings kind of weirdly have to have to bring these two things together. So it sounds like this lady has found actually quite an interesting way of, of, of managing those aspects mm -hmm. because she enjoys, for example, remodeling a house, making it the way she wants. But then she also enjoys the the creative process, the, the the not having, the kind of moving towards something. It's not so, getting it that's making her happy, it's yes. the pursuit that's making her happy. Exactly, and she's found a way, a healthy way, because if you don't find a healthy way of doing that, we talked about this with the love episode, mm. um, if you don't find a healthy way to enjoy that, that experience, it'll come out in unhealthy ways. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, Drive and desire. It's funny. We don't we don't experience drive. We don't see it. It's unconscious. Mm. Like we never think I actually enjoy not getting something. All right, you know, we don't <laughs> think like that. But there is this pleasure to, break, you know, breaking everything open, starting again, mm. cre recreating. It's it's sort of, sort of like seeking in a way, right? Mm. So the it's the seeking for her. That I don't think she's looking at it as unhealthy because someone else in her life is saying, hey, you just did that. But maybe maybe what your husband needs to realize here is that as opposed to the the you know, the pursuit of happiness, it's more about the happiness of pursuit in, in your case. And and it's not going to be about reaching a for me, I'm a bit of a completist, even though I know that's a, an error in, in my own ways, because like, it's never going to be complete. Uh, your house is not going to be finished right because you especially with a personality like emma's she she's going to want to continue to change things mm -hmm. to improve things because she needs that variety in order to feel fulfilled yes is yeah. it possible for emma or for anyone for that matter to actually look at that drive that unconscious is there a way for us to at, at least you know because when i think of emma it's like there, there is a drive obviously that's happening with her can she maybe dig deep see where that drive is coming from and find other ways besides constantly redecorating her house to kind of fulfill that drive. Yeah, that's a great point. And yeah, I think we can. The funny thing is I would argue that weirdly we can never directly see it mm -hmm. because it's almost like consciously, and this comes back to the anxiety thing actually is, so consciously we are in the realm of utilitarianism and we maximize our pleasure, we minimize our pain, we, we're, we're, we're pursuing things that we want. And mm -hmm. so consciously, that's all we ever see. That's the Nietzschean will to power. Mm -hmm. but, but our unconscious, there's this weird thing where we actually directly desire the not having. Mm -hmm. We desire to shake things up. And what I would say is, yeah, it's a, the way you said it was beautiful. So you become aware of that dimension of yourself you make space for that dimension of yourself, mm -hmm. um, but you can never get rid of it. This is almost coming back to that you can't lack the lack. The lack will always be there, mm -hmm. and it's about how to enjoy it, how to find a way that that is beneficial. So, for example, if you're always redecorating and you're going through your money, and you know it's going to actually damage you financially, then then one has to find a better way yeah. to express that lack. Yeah. 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 Well, it, so it, Ryan, you, yeah. Let me ask you this. In, in 
with Emma, it seems to me like she's not having a, a sort of crisis where it's making her broke or whatever. She yeah, enjoys it's not ruining her household. Yeah, yeah, yeah. she, she in, in, enjoys improving and changing her home decor, right? Yeah. And she enjoys maybe trying out new jobs. Now, there's a difference between between that, being intentional about moving on to new things, and Spartanism. Spartanism mm-hmm. is sort of a form of OCD and, and people who can't stop letting go of things, including relationships and housing and, and, and material possessions and everything else. Mm-hmm. And I, it doesn't seem to me that that's the position that Emma is in. It seems no. to me that she wants to continue to improve. And I say, if that's not harming other areas of your life, I don't really see a problem with it. I don't either. It's like, uh, let's say I was really into getting new clothes all the time and I had a group of friends and we did this in high school, man, mm. where we just constantly traded clothes. Yeah. It was it was like, I mean, we didn't go out and buy new stuff. It was like half of my wardrobe I got from either you or Jerome or Ruben. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I don't see I don't see anything wrong with it either. It's almost like, we're giving her permission to like keep doing what she's doing. I mean, if she if for some reason it is causing some distress, I mean, there are a couple things she can do that I that I've thought of. Like, you know, she can set some rules up around how often she can decorate, once a year, twice a year, whatever it is. Um, there are also I've seen these games that you can get on iPad that it's it's just redecorating games. Oh, like yeah. you can just sit there and like decorate a new house, build new houses and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so there there might be some other outlets for her, but back to your point, if this isn't like creating a huge distress in her household, if it's not, you know, is it the, it, like the question is, is the anxiety that she's experiencing, is it from, uh, you know, a pain that is becoming, uh, you know, evident in her life or is it, the pain that she feels like she should be having in her life because she likes to do this. Does that make sense? Yeah, we, we, we had Bobby Burke on, and he, he talked about some tips. We, we had him on the podcast. He's from uh, that, that TV show Queer Eye. Oh, uh, yeah, I've heard of it. He's like an interior designer, and he runs this, this uh, inter- interior design company. And one of the things that he talks about on his, his blog and other places uh, is you know, in order to make your space fresh, you don't have to like completely... You know, swap out everything that you have, and right. I think this could, there's this is a metaphor for something else. You can you can change a few things, like literally change the window dressing, or in other areas of life, figuratively change <laughs> the window dressing. You can't change the things around you. <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> oh wait, yeah, that's what you can. <laughs> and and um, it, so so you can you can change the sort of accents in a room, and it totally changes the the way the the place feels you can even move furniture around without changing the furniture and all of a sudden you feel like you're in, in a different space yeah now peter we we have a need for for change uh and, and is that because we all just uh, as humans we, we we're seeking more we're seeking better yeah well i think it comes back to your your first question as you opened it with the question of lack and then i talked about freedom and the reason why i talked about freedom was because freedom from this Kantian perspective is the name for lack. Freedom is the experience of a type of lack in your subjectivity and being that expresses itself in anxiety. Um, But the idea, if that's true, then lack is a part of what it is to be a subject. It's, It's who we are, it's what we are. And Emma gives us a beautiful example of I think kind of a healthy way in which lack is integrated into one's life. Because yeah. there's a lack, there's a sense of, no, this could be better, you know, this could be different. So there is a sense of lack and there is a sense of wanting to change, but it's it's it creates something productive and creative. Um, so uh, yeah, I think that, that this all connects with this notion of we want to overcome it. We want to get rid of our freedom. That's why, by the way, Sartre said we're condemned to freedom. You know, it's a weird saying because you think we would love to be free, but he right. says, no, we're condemned to freedom mm-hmm. because in some ways he says we're terrified of this this dizziness, this fact that, that there's lack and we can reimagine our lives. And there's a million ways to reimagine your life. Mm-hmm. There's a million different, it's infinite. And every time you make one decision, you close off a million other decisions. So it's mm-hmm. this, and we want to get rid of that. We would love to get back on track. We would love to become animals again. Yeah. And that's why we take drugs oh, wow. sometimes. That kind of is to get rid of the dizziness of freedom. Yeah. Because, and, and it's nothing wrong with trying to get rid of it occasionally, like just mm-hmm. to relax. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because the, 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 the sense of freedom is a lot to bear. It's overwhelming. I mean, it's overwhelming. Sure. It's like yeah. why a lot of people are fatigued and stuff is because mm-hmm. like deep down, there's a lot of psychic energies required 
to to keep going. That's why you know you get drunk sometimes just to kind of maybe feel a little bit of an escape from the freedom. Mm. <laughs> But yeah. well, I, I'm looking at Emma, and well, I think we can wrap up her question with this. And I, I see that maybe she's going for something. Like for me, I, there would be some in game uh, where I'm like, uh, as soon as I have X, Y, and Z again, I'm a, a bit of a completist here. Then all of a sudden, I'll give my per myself permission to feel free. Mm -hmm. Where as for her, it seems like the freedom is, is actually in. In, in the seeking, it's not about a particular outcome for her because mm -hmm. it's like a horizon in a way. Once you reach a horizon, there will always be a, a new horizon. So she's seeking out the new horizon. And I think as long as you're doing that in a healthy way, uh, th it's better than the alternative. Mm -hmm. I bet you that me and you have a similar type of apartment. I don't know. You've seen my apartment. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. definitely similar. Yeah. Because I, because I mean, I Peter have... actually is more minimalist than, than you, but I, it's very similar. I'm more, I, mean, I have I a more minimalist. Daughter, so. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But I'm more minimalist than the minimalist. That's but right, I, yeah. But there's an obsessiveness to my apartment. Mm -hmm. and everything is complete. And it's embarrassingly, my bookshelves, I've got the books ordered by size so that they're all the, the right line because I yeah. would crack me up if there was a book out of place. I love it. Um, I love that. And yeah. the funny thing is, so that runs in my family a little bit. And at its worst, you know, sometimes that can be a way of precisely trying to, you know, escape from my freedom by having everything right. Mm. So there's no disorder in it to, mm. to escape the, 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 the anxiety of my freedom. Yeah. But that But, in and of itself <laughs> is a disorder. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. That's why, you know, for someone, the advice is tied to your room. But for someone else, it might be mess your room up because your room is like a morgue. You've created a room that is so tidy that's actually a disorder <laughs> you need a little bit of mess like i'd probably be healthier if just one of my books was out of place just a little bit out of place yeah yeah i had a friend who used to do that he would just come in and change a book just to see if it would mess with me yeah. just to gaslight me and it would. I, i used to do that with my ocd friends yeah, i would just right, like yeah. move something around a little bit and yeah, yeah. see if they notice it like, uh, <laughs> so uh, when you talk about this the feeling of the lack mm. being freedom yeah. uh you often talk about uh the secret of the lack yeah. is that kind of the same thing where Like if we can look at the lack as like that's actually our freedom and we should learn to appreciate it. Is that kind of along the same lines as when you talk about the secret of the lack? That's absolutely. So th there's a coin I have. You've, you guys have seen that. Yeah. It has around the side of it. I've just. It's funny. It's just a coin with these symbols that mm -hmm. describe these. It looks ideas. like a very uh, like a Freemason type. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like an occultic thing, and the right. idea is like this occultic coin. Yeah. Um, yeah. To make it desirable, I want it to be object A for people. They really want it because they can't get it. Yeah. Um, but along the side. The words say the lack of the secret or the secret of the lack. You can read it either way. Mm -hmm. So depending on where you start. Yeah. And the, for me, the idea is that we start with the, the lack of the secret. And what I mean by that is our natural thing is I lack the secret. There's something out there that will make me whole and complete. There's something that I should be doing. Mm -hmm. Fear of missing out. Is, what is it? And we have this anxiety of yeah. the lack of the secret. And the movement is to go from the lack of the secret to the secret of the lack, where you go, oh, no. There isn't something that will complete the lack. The lack is the secret. The right. secret to joy and depth of meaning and creativity and mm -hmm. vocation is actually experiencing the struggle and the lack and directly enjoying it. Yeah. So for me, the challenge all of us face is moving from the lack of the secret. <gasps> What is it? What is it I'm missing? What is it I'm missing? What is it I'm missing? To the secret of the lack. Mm. You go, I am lacking. That's where my freedom is. That's where my subjectivity is. That's what it is to be human. Mm. Like that's that's our, it's not the thing to get rid of. It's the highest dimension of reality. It's like, it's, it's, it's the universe has created freedom. Mm. It took billions of years and freedom erupts in subjectivity. It's very impressive. Yeah. Well, the, the message of minimalism is you probably don't need that, which yeah. really means forming a detente with the lack because there will always be something else we feel that we need. And and so like if you didn't need it five minutes ago, you probably don't need it now. That that may be a good message for, for Emma to hear at this point. Mm. Uh, and, That's and, a good rule to follow in general. Right, if right. Didn't, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and there may be exceptions to that, sure, right? Always. And, and so... Emma, I'm not saying uh, be a, a complete utilitarian here. Uh, in fact, I think uh, Pete could talk about the, the flaws with utilitarianism. I'm sure we can get into that on, on the maximal. But uh, I think there's, there's a need for aesthetic beauty. Our, our friend Rob Belt will talk about you know, the flowers and how they attract bees. That's, it's an essential part of their being. And beauty is essential. And so 
Emma, what you want to do is you do want to have some beauty in your space, but it also realizing that it's never going to be perfect. It, mm. and, and there is something that she can do that oh. will fix is she could come around and decorate my place if she wanted to, <laughs> which I think is a perfect solution. Yeah. I have a feeling if she did that, Peter, you, it, you would just undo it all. Like. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Emma, I'm going to send you a copy of our book, Everything That Remains. It's really the, the story of questioning the status quo. You talk about change. I think it was the, the five-year period of our lives where we went through probably the most profound change mm. of our lives from our late 20s to our early 30s. Ryan and I were these suit and tie corporate guys and became minimalists and eventually the minimalists and we wrote a book about it. It's my favorite thing we've ever done. It, it's called Everything That Remains. It's a memoir by The Minimalist. If you like our podcast, you'll like the audiobook version of that. Or if you want the book book or the ebook version, we're happy to send those to you as well. Adriana has a question, but we're short on time. So we're going to save that for the maximal episode. And Ryan, let's move on over to the lightning round. All right. That's what it's time for. And this is where we answer your text messages. You can text your questions and comments and your smart remarks to area code 937-202-4654. Yes, indeed. Those texts go to both of our phones, and we personally respond to as many as we can. We even answer some on the podcast. Now, Pete, I'm sure you'll remember this. During the lightning round, this is where Ryan and I and our guests, we do our best to answer questions with a short, shareable, less than 140-character response. We put the text to these minimal maxims in the show notes mm -hmm. so people can copy and share our pithy answers on social media if they'd like right. <laughs> now we've had days challenge. josh oh and I, yeah josh and i've had days to prepare for this uh -huh. and you will have like minutes and i have heard you <laughs> do this and talk for ages i i've heard that i don't know if yeah. you still do it but i've we heard do you do. Go, oh we 140 and then you have five minutes so <laughs> at least five yeah. at least yes <laughs> all right we have a question i don't know if this is from this peter but it's from P it, someone named peter it's from yeah it's from someone named peter I am addicted to phones and accessories. I regularly feel like I need something new, different material, clothing, anything new. How can I stop that? Uh, so let, let's, let's just, I'll give you my pithy answer and then maybe, maybe you can unpack this because I, I, there's this term I want to talk to you about. Uh, so my pithy answer is this, new isn't better, it's merely newer. Now there's this, this concept of uh, contemporaneity which basically means that you know, one, one way that people use that term is that if it's new, it's better. Mm -hmm. And I think quite often we assume that. If I go onto YouTube and I see like, oh, someone has posted an interview with someone I really like, but then I'm like, but it's a year old. Yeah. Why would I want to watch something that's a whole year old? Yeah, I, I have to fight that feeling when I see albums where I'm like, oh, this is a great album, great song. And then I'm like, oh, it's from 2016. Like, oh. I don't know if I should like this. Right. Which is, <laughs> makes is, no sense. It's so silly. I've never heard it before. Right. And, and, and so this, this idea of contemporaneity, th things are, are better if they're newer, is, is false. However, the opposite is also true. Just because something is traditional doesn't mean we shouldn't question that either, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Yeah. I like that a lot. Oh, that, oh, you stopped there. That's good. You kept it pretty pithy. Well done. <laughs> I like it. That was only like 680. Well, yeah, that's still yeah. not in a tweet. But it's, in a, it's in a few tweets. It's a tweet okay. thread. Yeah. He'll tweet, he'll tweet, yeah, Sean yeah. will tweet something up. Okay, so now my turn? Yep. Okay. If I was ta what, talking to Peter, yep. um, I would ask, I'd be interested in whether there's some connection between this desire for the new and some aspect of his past. Like sometimes what we're desiring is kind of, for example, a person might feel that um, uh, new things were valued in their house or they, they felt old, like, or they, they had a, a new kid, they were the youngest or they're the oldest, another kid comes along and they're the new kid. Mm. And then they're kind of, they feel that they're put to the background. Mm, yeah. There's all sorts of reasons why why we can be addicted to something. It's, it seems weird at first to go, I love new things. And then you do a bit of, internal work and you realize oh it's because i wanted to take the place of my baby brother who was new mm -hmm. so it's always impossible to know what it is but often when i when you're interested in something it's fun to try to make connections with whether that connects with something in your past and then if you work that out your desire for new stuff will disappear that's mm -hmm. the funny thing if you try to sometimes fix this it it doesn't work but if you can find what it's connected to. Mm. Um, okay, yeah, I'll stop there. Yeah, no, you're, no, you're saying the, the cause of it, right? So yeah, you're, the cause. you're revealing that you're a determinist after all. Uh, yes, there's a lot of, absolutely, in some respects. <laughs> well, it's, well, you saying that actually makes me think, so that drive that we can never really see, 
but there might be some things that happen in our lives that have created that drive maybe yeah. in, in a way. Yeah. yeah, they connect. It's funny, like, so in, in analysis, one of the weird things that happens is often an analyst doesn't tell you something that's really hard to see. It's completely on the surface where you'll say something and then two to two weeks later, you'll say something else and the analyst will just go, oh, it's funny that you said you said this last week about when you were young mm -hmm. and they'll connect it with something you're doing now and you'll suddenly go, oh my goodness, that's so clear that what yeah. how I'm acting to with my wife or husband is exactly what I played out with my sibling or my mother or my father. And 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 once you see that, sometimes that insight can be enough to change one's behavior. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's fascinating. I like that. All right, uh, my pithy answer is this. New products don't equal a new you. And I think that we often go after new clothes or new gadgets because it's like, oh, we're renewing ourselves. We're making a new, I'm making a new Ryan if I update my laptop. Mm -hmm. And you know, new products don't make you a new you. New actions, that's what makes you a new you. Right. So I don't know if you could add that to the pithy part of it, but, uh, but yeah. that's really how you create a new self is by, is by your actions. It's interesting though, uh, we we do this with, like I do with my nails. That's why I constantly chew my nails. Uh -huh. It's because I feel like if I could just get my nail perfect, mm -hmm. that I'm going to have just, I'm going to be that much closer to a better version of Ryan. I've got, you know, I'll like be doing this to my scruff and I'll feel like that one long hair I missed when I shaved. If I could just pluck that one long hair, I'm going to be just, I'm going to be one hair closer mm. to a new version of Ryan. And I think we do this with products. Can so. you psychoanalyze this? Because my, <laughs> my hair is too much there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not getting paid enough. <laughs> to me, I see, I, I, I associate it with anxiety uh, as well. It, well, you know, it is an anxious tick. Right. But, that, but that's where the anxiety comes from. Right. There's something in me that I'm like, I just need to be a little bit better. I just mm -hmm. need I just need to be a little bit a little bit more trimmed up and I could do that by biting my nail. And yeah. oh by the way, it's gonna be a distraction from the lack, from yeah. the anxiety. My, my, so, so I think we're both. I think we're saying the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, what I'm saying is, you know, what what is what is behind even that? But if, behind if, the lack. If we go even if we even go f farther back, like behind the. So we already determined the why, but what's the why behind the why? So I actually, so my. I had this realization uh, a week or two ago. I actually called you when uh -huh. I had when I kind of had this realization. I don't think I went as deep as I uh, I didn't I didn't take the conversation as deep with you as I did with myself. But I went down this beautiful little rabbit hole of why I feel anxious all the time, or why I get spurts of anxiety because I don't feel anxious. Like right now, I'm not anxious. Right. But I get these spurts of anxiety that are it's overwhelming, mm -hmm. and uh, it's the feeling of not being. Uh, adequate mm -hmm. like if there is a feeling that I that roots back to my childhood of not being enough for whatever reason so f that that's the why is, is what I look at I would love to go deeper with that um, I haven't been able to go deeper but I have realized that all my anxiety it really does root from there's something sparked in me that happens in the here and now where I'm like man if I could have just done it better if I could have just done it differently if I would have done something yesterday you know like that's the, the, the anxiety I experience of, of feeling like I'm not adequate enough. And that, that's the anxiety of guilt, by the way. So mm -hmm. guilt, all guilt is, yeah. is the sense of I am not something that I should be. So there's, mm -hmm. there's three ways in which the lack appears in our being, death, meaninglessness, and guilt. So mm -hmm. death is the lack of being, so anxiety by I'm gonna die. Mm -hmm. right, that's an easy mm -hmm. one. Guilt is the sense of it's also about a lack because it's a lack of being. Every time you're guilty, you have a, an image of who you should be and you don't match it. So there's a lack. There's a there's a disparity between who you are and who you would like to be. And then meaninglessness. Well, can I pause you oh. there? Because I want to expand oh, yeah. on that one, right? Yeah. So, so what you're saying is your actions don't match the person you want to be. I would just, I would call that your actions don't match your values or, or, oh, yeah. or the, the person that you, that you value. Um, and so um, that creates a, a, a type of suffering if we don't address it. And so are you saying that if we address it in a way that we change our behaviors, then therefore we are, you know, we may mitigate the suffering in some way? Yeah, well, I would say there's like, there's two ways to address guilt. Uh, one way is the common way, the common sense way we think about it, which is we change our actions, we try to become who we want to be. Mm -hmm. The other technology, let's call that technology self-help. The other technology is called grace. And grace is the opposite. Grace is where you go, I don't have to change. Mm 
Mm. You fully, but it's not that you. But think, what if you're behaving like a piece of? It, what if you're yes. being a, a piece of garbage, right? This is, yeah, okay. Do you want to say any more about that? Because that's exactly no, what well, yeah. and, and so, like, in fact, yeah. my wife and I were having this argument recently. Like, and actually, you know what? Let's save this for the maximal <laughs> because I need to talk to you about religion. I thought okay. Bex liked it when you called her garbage. Only in a certain yeah. room. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> uh, but no, no I, I want to get into more of this. Um, I got so much more to talk about. We, we, um, Don't forget that then because I think that'll be a great conversation. Right. Uh, yeah, we, we're, yeah, we're definitely going to get into it because I, I need to talk to you. In fact, I wrote down here, uh, atheists versus religious people, do they equal rep Republicans versus Democrats? Um, we're going to talk about that. Um, I want to talk about wearing masks in today. Why has that become political? Um, and where I think Ryan and I might disagree a little bit uh, about this as well. And w maybe you can mediate the the, the boxing match that we're going to have. <laughs> uh, we got some listener tips today as well. Although, by the way, I, I do need to mention this real quick. We had a listener call in a few weeks ago and, and recommend there's a service called unroll.me. I guess you can give them access to your email and it unrolls you from Ooh, all of these. I used to do that. You used, I used to do to it. Have it. It's great. Okay. It was great. But That's also, they have some privacy concerns. We'll put a link to the article of the privacy oh. concerns with. <laughs> I and, saw that come through, yeah. And so I, I've never recommended them. I haven't used them them personally, but apparently we've actually had quite a few listeners who have recommended <laughs> them in the past. They, they'll, they'll always tweet me and stuff. Anyway, when we recommended it on the podcast, we had a listener recommend it. I'm sure they didn't know. There were some privacy concerns there. It, so, it sounds like they were selling some data to Uber or Spotify or someone. I, I don't know who they were selling it yeah. to. There's a there is a article that we'll put a link to in the show notes. We also have an added value segment today i want to talk to you um about something that was hilarious but in a way that i haven't experienced in a long time but first we have a bunch more surprise questions this week like can you avoid being trendy with fashion and still f still feel like you're not missing out so we're talking about trends and missing out uh, how do you distinguish between what you actually need in your life and what you think you need in your life mm. how do you deal with guilt when you slip up how much stuff is too much stuff and what is Marie Kondo missing out on? <laughs> this is becoming a meme at this point. That's hilarious. Marie, Marie Kondo is our Joel Osteen. Okay, all right. Ah. So, yeah. so we'll, we'll get into that but as like, well. But like the last, I don't know, seven uh, maximal episodes, we've had questions about what would Marie Kondo do? Right. WWMD. <laughs> WWMKD. We're, right. we're, we'll get there. Also, uh, we're going to talk about Jomo. Uh, we can apply JOMO to our time and productivity, but can we apply it to our stuff in other areas of life? We're talking about the mask wearing controversies. We're going to talk about heresy. I feel like we already ha we already hashed out the mask wearing controversy. Yeah, but I deleted it, but we're going to talk about. Oh, why. okay, all right. Uh, we're going to talk about pyro theology. Ooh. We're going to talk about unraveling. Oh yes. Uh, we're going to talk about a million other questions. We're going to get through all FOMA. of that. Yes. All of it. How, like, how many days? I dare us. We have 24 hours. <laughs> yeah, that's how long our maximal episode is. That's right. Uh, by the way, if you want to hear all that, check out this week's maximal episode on the Minimalist Private Podcast. It's a completely separate podcast, and it's just uh, a couple bucks, two bucks. And it is the most honest way for the minimalist to earn an income because we don't believe in advertisements. So we make money if and only if. <laughs> you find value in and support what we create. Advertisements suck. Head on over to theminimalists.com <laughs> slash support to subscribe and get your personal link so that our private podcast play in your favorite podcast app. Ryan, what else you got for us this week? Here are some voicemail comments and tips from our listeners. Check them out. Hey there, this is McKinley calling from Oklahoma City. Um, I just had a tip for the other listeners. I, when going through my closet, um, noticed that a lot of things I held on to just in case and so I decided to upcycle and repurpose my clothes. So I'm not a dress person. I ended up taking a lot of my dresses and cutting them into tops and then using the bottom part um, for creative things like headbands and tube tops and skirts um, and all kinds of things. And then going through my clothes for donations, the things that I didn't want to repurpose or didn't need to hold on to, I put into a bag and I saved for a clothing trade party with my friends. So all of us go through our clothes and get donations and then sit around and exchange them. That way we know they don't go into landfills and that we are living sustainably. Hey, Josh and Ryan. It's Zach from the Bay Area here in California. Just calling in because I wanted to comment on Rashid from Massachusetts' comment about choosing whether to um, keep things in storage um, for his retirement home. Something me and my wife recently did was we let go of a couch uh, that we had been gifted not by actually selling it or giving it away, but by actually asking a friend to hang on to it um, and potentially give it back to us if later in life we were to find a two- or three-bedroom 
apartment or house here in the Bay that we could use it. So it was a win-win. Our friend got to borrow a couch and kind of enhance a kind of movie style garage. And we allowed ourselves to obtain more living space in our living room with a newer couch uh, that we recently acquired that um, works with the aesthetic a little bit better, is a pullout for friends and family, and uh, ultimately just works better for us now. All right, y'all, that is almost it. We have uh, Peter Rollins here. Before we thank him, it sounds like he has one more pithy answer for us. Oh, yes. No, I was just thinking about the new. The idea of the new is mm. it sounds weird at first, but sometimes for like uh, Apple, what what's really the thing that makes you desire it is not the computer, but the box that the computer is in. Yeah. That What's happening is we're always looking for object A and look at the, pre if you're listening to this for the first time, there's an episode we did on object A, which yeah, is desire. Yeah, this object that doesn't exist, but you imagine it exists that will satisfy you. Mm -hmm. And what these companies are selling you with the new car, the new iPhone, the new computer is often the promise that this will be object A, the thing that will fix everything. Mm -hmm. You get the box, you're, that's where the pleasure is. You're opening the box to get the amazing object then it lets you down and so you have to do it again the next year mm. so it's how do we become free from this fantasy of the object that is gonna fix everything and so yeah. in a way we're more addicted to the box than the product mm. yeah that's good yeah. that is pithy you can tweet that podcast sean well peter rollins i want to thank you for being here today i'm going to encourage folks to check out your podcast it's called the Fund fundamentalists and uh, you can find that wherever you check out podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, etc. We'll put a link to it in the show notes. Also, uh, PeterRollins.com. They can find your courses there, your Patreon there, your YouTube channel there. Where you've got a bunch of new videos you've put up on your YouTube channel. We'll put a link to PeterRollins.com in the show notes as well. Thank you so much for being here today. You're Thank awesome, you. man. Thanks a lot, guys. <laughs> well, I've got an added value today. Ryan, you and I were talking about him on the phone. There's a I guess you could call him a stand-up comedian. I wouldn't call this a stand-up comedy special. It's a, it's a, well, I think what do they call it? A stand-up show. It, 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 so it, he okay. he went back to his hometown in like Alabama and played at like some dive bar. He did like a, and I say played. He did a live stand-up show, but he also did some music. It's also part documentary. Hmm. His name is Whitmer Thomas. The show it's on HBO, and it is called The Golden One. And there are just jokes from that that have stuck with me that I keep using them with Bex. They're really absurdist sort of jokes, but it's the whole thing is is about dealing with his mother's death through comedy. Like we all have these sort of ways that we try to, I don't know, there's these cathartic ways of dealing with, with the major life events. Mm. And I think it may have been Kafka who, who said that life's most difficult uh, events can be talked about only through jokes and and so when you you you're able to sort of approximate the pain and the suffering felt from the death of a loved one through humor in a way that's almost impossible to talk about head on and so he does it masterfully in this special and he's also he's as silly as we ever are like it's like absurdist silliness from the south <laughs> and uh, I can't recommend it enough it is called The Golden One by Whitmer Thomas. You gotta check it out. Uh, for right here, right now, here's one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalists. If you wanna see Ryan's home and, and, and my home, we have a, a tour of both on our website. Just go to the resources page on our website, theminimalists.com. Click on resources at the top, bunch of free resources there, including a, a tour of both of our homes. If you wanna see how OCD I am, that's where that's where you can figure that out. I love the note you have here. Bask in our lack. <laughs> <laughs> bask in our that. lack. <laughs> yeah, bask in the, the lack of, of stuff, oh, for sure. Yeah, uh, you can follow The Minimalists on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, at The Minimalists. Come to one of our live podcast shows. Visit theminimalists.com slash tour to find a city near you when we are back on tour. But you can sign up for our email list there. In the meantime, we already have some dates announced in the not too distant future theminimalists.com slash tour if you have a question comment or minimalism tip for our podcast email a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com you can comment on this episode at youtube.com slash theminimalists and if you want our show notes in your inbox sign up for our email list over at theminimalists.com you'll also receive our simple Sunday emails and if you leave here today with just one message we hope it's this love people and use things because the opposite never works Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. 
Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing that's just feeding your greed. Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it.